This is my grandmother. Her name is Jessie Butler. She was born in 1900. She was married to my grandfather, who was an all-American football player and an African Methodist Episcopalian minister. At that time, probably due to a lack of birth control, but also due to the uncertainty of birth, people used to have lots of children because you didn't know how many would survive to adulthood. My grandmother had a total of 10 children, and the answer was five survived to adulthood. Three died at birth, one died of tuberculosis, one died of tuberculosis, and another of polio. However, even in such a constrained time, a time when the South was segregated, at a time when people were extremely poor, families were able to transmit values, philosophies, and have great hope for their children. My mother is somewhere in this group of uh, kids at church, but this is her in her mid-20s when she was at the Washington Post as the first African-American female reporter. This is her many years later, much like me, talking on a stage. And those ideas, these hopes for children, weren't elusive even for young men who were born in Mississippi, again, to a four poor family, lots of children, total of eight brothers and sisters, but they could still dream of being an artist. And this is my father, Sam Gilliam. This is him many years later after a full career of being an artist. And this is him again, much like me, speaking to you on a stage. And so I'm the legacy of this arc, this arc, this what I call the reproductive life course. This idea that families, even in constrained times, can develop and kids can reach their full potential. And I see this as an interplay between science and public health and technology and economics and politics, where in times when things, when times are peaceful and people have room, youth can develop. So this is how developmental economists think about it. So you can see at the bottom, in countries where there's very severe war, famine, kids don't live very long. But as a gross domestic product increases, you get these long life expectancies, and that's the, national, the natural trend. In 2008, I was in Uganda. And I think this picture, which is from a labor and delivery board, where they talk about what happened the night before, I think gives us a lot of information about societies where really those transitions have not occurred. So. On the left side, they talk about the women who came in that evening. That day, 81 women were seen. There were a total of 54 deliveries. Five, I'm sorry, 42 were vaginal deliveries, and 13 were cesarean deliveries. There were breech deliveries. There were multiple deliveries, meaning twins. But they used the term FSB, fresh stillborn. Those are the babies that died in utero but it happened recently, so the skin was still intact, as opposed to MSB, a macerated stillborn. It had happened so long ago that the skin had started to fall apart. These are most likely the women who were at risk for fistula because they labored and labored and labored and still couldn't deliver. PET is preeclampsia, and eclampsia are the women who had such bad hypertensive disease that they actually seized and came in convulsing. They wanted to have a special report. We wanted to talk specifically about the two with eclampsia, the one with severe anemia, and the one who ruptured the uterus. One of the ones with eclampsia was 17 years old, and she came in at term after laboring for four days, and that was one of the macerated stillborn. One of the women with a ruptured uterus was 21 years old, and this was her fourth pregnancy, and she was the one who ruptured her uterus, and the baby was born dead. In the United States, reproductive health, may not, we may not be seeing those numbers and those tragedies at birth, but we still don't do as well as we should given our GDP and our level of development. One of the main issues is adolescent pregnancy. Right now we're doing better than we ever have with teen pregnancy. Only about 400,000 teens will give birth. That's down from higher rates than we've always had in this country. Nevertheless, that's 4% of teens ages 15 to 19 will give birth. 
Similarly, we have extremely high rates of sexually transmitted infections. These are rates of chlamydia, and you'll see that they predominantly affect young people. But similarly, we have high rates of HIV. 1.1 million people are living with HIV in the United States, and 20% of people don't know they're infected. So my job is as an obstetrician gynecologist, a family planner, and a pediatric and adolescent gynecologist. And so that arc, what I call the reproductive life course, this idea of what happens between planning pregnancies, having children, and watching them over time, watching them as they develop, and working with families to help young people reach their full potential. That's my purview. And these are my basic tools, contraception and condoms. We have really good methods of preventing pregnancy. And this is critical. If you go back to what we saw in Uganda, so much of that could have been avoided and alleviated through family planning. If that 17-year-old had delayed pregnancy, the chances of her getting preeclampsia would have been lower. If a 21-year-old after having multiple pregnancies and weakening the wall of her uterus, had used family planning, then her uterus wouldn't have ruptured because she wouldn't have become pregnant again. If the woman with severe anemia had used family planning, she would have had the opportunity for her physical re clock to reset. Her blood stores would have been restored. And in the next pregnancy, she wouldn't have been anemic. In the United States, if we could get adolescents using highly effective methods of contraception, then we would have more planned pregnancies in this country. The reality right now is the vast majority of pregnancies in this country are unintended and unplanned. And so these are really important tools, but they're biomedical. Increasingly in medical medicine, we're working in teams. We work in teams of experts. So if you came to me and you said, I have this problem, I would see what could be solved through gynecology, but I wouldn't try to treat your rapid heartbeat or your hypertension. I'd call one of my colleagues who's an internist or a cardiologist. So when you put these teams together, you have the expertise and the diverse perspectives that are needed so that we don't reduce people, we don't oversimplify their problems, we can start to address issues in their full complexity. And so I began to think, why aren't we doing that in sexual and reproductive health? Because sexual and reproductive health is more than just having a child and seeing that the child is live born. It's this whole process where we as communities and people and individuals are trans transmitting, whether through DNA, through ideas or thoughts, our ideas from one person to the next. And that's not the purview of just one single profession. So I began to look around and I began to ask, well, who are the people? Who are the people here at the University of Chicago? Who are the people on campus and off campus who can contribute to the well-being of women and children, who can con contribute to how adolescents develop, who can help with these major problems that have been intractable for so long, reducing teen pregnancy, reducing rates of HIV AIDS, reducing STDs. And so this is the pathway. These are the people I identified, whether they were on campus or off campus. And I feel like my shoe budget has really increased because I just walked and walked and walked around campus and met and talked to people. We came together in one of the many buildings here in Chicago to talk about what this might look like. People from economics to English literature to medicine to biology to computer science to education because these are the many people who have the ability to impact the next generation, youth, and our local community and global community. And we began to make partnerships and share conversations. And I call it um, uncommon, uncommon partnerships with uncommon solutions for common ideas. And the result is a center called the Center for Interdisciplinary Inquiry and Innovation, CI3, which is much easier, in sexual and reproductive health. 
And the idea is to bring rare teams together so that we can start to find new ways to move these problems forward. When I talk about sexual health and reproduction, I mean the DNA part, I mean the biologic, and I mean sex. But I also mean reproducing ideas and sharing ideas and the ways in which we as human beings touch one another. In medicine, we use narrative. Patients come to us with their stories. So here you see youth coming to us with stories, stories from their everyday life. And one of our ideas is that if we can use narrative, the power of experiences, and show young people, especially young people who come from more traditionally disenfranchised communities, we can show them the power of their voice. We're teaching them to code. We're teaching them to design games, to take photographs, to take their lives and their experiences and repurpose them in new ways. We're designing games. This is a game that one, one group designed. It's called What is Stork? And it's a transmedia game or an augmented reality game where they began to notice that by reading the newspaper, that if you're on the north side of Chicago, you can hand over your credit card and that obstetrician is there whenever you want to deliver. And they said, what about on the south side of Chicago? It's like, mm, not so much so. So they imagine, what if this, this inequality of access to reproductive health care, what if we represented it as a machine? A machine that could give you the perfect baby. And it was controlled by a company called Stork. And so they created a game that they eventually pushed out all over to, to friends and people all over the city and even outside of the city, where playing across multiple technological platforms, Young people could understand rates of chlamydia, the things that cause infertility, the reason that you might need a machine such as this, healthcare disparities and healthcare inequalities. We're bringing together neuroscientists with psychologists, artists with youth. We're working in countries like Nigeria to look at issues like postpartum hemorrhage and family planning. But the idea is that by leaving our disciplinary silos, we can begin to move these ideas forward. So when I think about sexual and reproductive health, I think about it from multiple disciplines. But I think about it as how we create a healthier next generation. But I also think about how it is a way of transmitting and sharing ideas with this generation. So here, we're focusing on how we communicate with one another, how we share ideas, how we break down silos and increase interdisciplinary research so that the next generation of young people has the health and opportunity that I've had. Thank you. <laughs>